right, so welcome back. We're going to get started. Let's see if we can get the, uh, the slide started here. So my name is Skylar Jones. I'm uh, one of the um, peripheral and coronary interventionalists at Duke University. I direct the Duke Cath Lab and uh, do some research in vascular disease and PAD. It's uh, my pleasure to start this session and moderate. Our friend Michael Jaff couldn't be here today, so um, I look to our other panelists to, to help moderate. And um, I, I think what we'll try to do is we'll uh, go through the sessions, eight minute, session, uh, eight minute presentations, and then we'll have a panel discussion at the end. Mehdi's got some uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, CMS and uh, coverage issues that we'll end the session with, and I'm sure that'll spark some flames. So um, our first uh, uh, presentation, well, let's see, let's get to the actual session here. I think is me. Is it me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we're still in the last session. Okay. Here we go. All right. So the first talk is... Um, my talk called Guideline Recommendations, and I changed the order, Guideline Recommendations and Evidence Gap for uh, antiplatelets. Um, you'll see here I do have some consulting fees that are applicable to the content of the talk. I won't actually talk about things that are off-label. Okay, here we go. I do have other uh, honorary research grants that have occurred since then. Again, should not... Uh, should not uh, change this. I'm going to start a timer here. Let's see if that starts. Can you please start a timer? There we go. All right. So we'll talk about the a treatment framework, some of the therapeutic op options that you're all familiar with, the heterogeneous approach that occurs in vascular disease, um, and then some of the clinical evidence or lack thereof and the guidelines because that was really the title of the talk. Um, the treatment framework I like to use is often really just this spectrum of PAD, um, medical therapy, ec exercise therapy that's uh, often commonly prescribed, and then the medications or drugs that are used either with or without uh, intervention. That's really been a focus of my uh, research over the last few years. Um, and then the decisions around uh, revascularization uh, and outcomes. So um, as we get to the before we get to the guidelines, we really should talk about the options. Everyone knows about aspirin. Uh, everyone knows about clopidogrel or Plavix. Um, many patients uh, are treated with um, celostazole or platol, but most of us don't use it really as an antiplatelet uh, agent, more of a, a, a disease modification agent. Newer therapies, uh, including um, voropaxar, ticagalor, uh, have been studied. We'll talk about some of that. And then warfarin's use, um, and then some of the direct oral anticoagulants, uh, previously the novel oral anticoagulants are being tested, so we'll talk a little bit about that. I don't want to say that we're still where we were 21 years ago when Capri came out, but we're about where we were in 1996 for antiplatelet use. When you look at uh, high-risk populations of patients with vascular disease, uh, these patients did have a overall risk uh, reduction a relative risk reduction of uh, about 8% with clopidogrel. It was not used despite a lot of uh, effort by um, the, uh, the manufacturer to increase awareness and, and, um, and uh, promote its use. As many of you know, um, PAD did have uh, a very nice um, um, you know, hazard ratio in terms of the use of uh, clopidogrel, and therefore we thought that PAD really might drive um, uh, a lot of its use turned out not to be the case at all. When you look at some of the work that we've done, we've done it in the United States, but this is um, evidence from uh, Denmark. The Danish uh, data that we looked at really was the use of antiplatelet use. And in Denmark, the great thing is they actually capture everything, including aspirin, so it's a prescription medication there. And you can see that in patients who have coronary disease, or coronary disease plus PAD, those patients are much more likely to actually receive both statins and antiplatelet medications. If you have PAD alone, um, you're much, much uh, less likely uh, to get it uh, used in the kind of 50% range, 50% less likely. So in my eyes, that prompts us to think, what is it that uh, about these patients uh, that are uh, make them less likely or significantly less likely to get 
um, common, easy to spell and say medications used uh, um, for disease prevention. A couple of years ago, we uh, were contracted by um, Medicare and HRQ to really do a systematic review. Some of you were at that MedCAC session. Uh, I still get um, uh, barbs thrown at me or aimed at me for that session, but um, but I think that it was a. I mean, it was really important to highlight the fact that we need to do more studies. The evidence base is lacking. Even when you can say that the dose of aspirin is unknown, and the use of aspirin, in, especially in asymptomatic PAD population, hasn't been well studied, and the hazard ratios cross one, that's meaningful because we need to do more work. Um, uh, I can understand people's frustration with what was said, um, but that was the data. Since that time, so that was a couple of years ago, I really had been focused on looking at vascular intervention. We published a couple of papers because if you think that the heterogeneity exists just in the clinics, it really exists in the office-based labs, in the hospital setting, and, uh, and, a, and uh, particularly after uh, vascular intervention. So we did this study of Medicare, and uh, all, all comers who uh, got treated, with, uh, or sorry, that underwent uh, vascular intervention, um, uh, this was uh, published in American Heart Journal uh, last year. It was about 85,000 patients. Almost a fifth of them were on oral anticoagulant uh, as a um, kind of baseline medication. If you look at the 80% who were eligible for PTY12 use, and remembering that um, aspirin isn't uh, prescribed in the United States, or sorry, it's not a prescription uh, medication, you can pick it up over the counter, that um, for PTY12 uh, use, many of these patients, so over a third of them, were on it previously. That mostly reflected being treated by cardiologists. Um, when you uh, look at those patients that didn't get any prescription or did not fill a prescription for an oral anticoagulant or a PTY12 antagonist, that was almost a quarter of those patients. So presumably they're getting aspirin, but we don't even, from this data, we don't know that. And then after that, the duration of antiplatelet uh, therapy was uh, really varied. So a small group got one to 30 days, and then um, a larger group got greater than 30 days. We tried to break it down three months, six months, or more, and it was just really difficult to uh, tease that out. It was, it was really a scatter plot when we looked at it. Um, over the past couple of years, a couple of randomized controlled trials have come out that have been uh, useful um, to learn about PAD patients. I'll say useful to learn about them rather than treat them because a lot of these agents haven't been adopted into our uh, current practice. Um, in two, uh, TRA2P, um, the Timmy group, Dave Morrow and Mark Banaka, really studied um, a larger group of about 3,000 PAD patients as a subgroup of the larger TRA2P study. Um, and you can see that, um, that Vorapaxar, a thrombin receptor antagonist, did reduce the primary endpoint, uh, primary ischemic endpoint by about 1.2%. You can see that that's at the uh, hazard of uh, major bleeding. Uh, which was gusto moderate or uh, severe for them, or for that study. Mark did a nice sub-analysis of uh, the PAD patients in this group, and you, I think probably the biggest thing that came out from this was the hospitalization for acute limb ischemia. So that was a nice uh, paper, and it prompted all of us to think about that more and figure out if we can uh, modify that risk um, in patients, especially patients who had um, vascular intervention in the past. Okay. Same group did a, a nice study of Ticagalor and Pegasus uh, over time. So again, antiplatelet uh, medication, um, and this is in stable patients. Only a, um, about 1,500 of these patients had PAD as their second or uh, rich, uh, risk in, uh, enrichment fa uh, factor. So you can see that there's a 90 milligram and a 60 milligram dose and then placebo. Um, I, most of these patients were about a year and a half after their MI. Um, in this group, you can see that, um, that patients with uh, PAD actually did have a, a lower rate of um, um, uh, major adverse events, uh, cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. It did, uh, that bleeding was a little bit higher, but not, um, not as striking as with Borapaxar, 
Um, and so in th these patients, the uh, premise, and again, a small subgroup of a larger population, was that for secondary prevention, those patients do benefit from more antiplatelet therapy. We were all set to uh, ring the bell with Euclid being presented last year. We conducted the study at DCRI. Manesh Patel and I helped direct it. Uh, it was a, a primary PAD population, almost 14,000 patients. Uh, single uh, antiplatelet therapy, ticagalor, clopidogrel. And I won't say it fell on its face, but it was, uh, as many people have said, beautifully neutral. Um, the hazard ratios for cardiovascular death, stroke, and uh, MI were basically overlapping, especially at the end. So 12.5% over about 30 uh, to 36 months of follow-up. Really disappointing for, um, for us, for our patients, because uh, we thought we had a good strategy of more antiplatelet use rather than um, you know, a standard clopidogrel uh, comparator. But in this setting, clopidogrel turned out to be a pretty good or a very effective um, comparator. Just getting back to the um, kind of basics of the talk, the guidelines which came out at the same time as Euclid last uh, November, uh, Marie Gerhardt led these. You can see that antiplatelet uh, therapy, so aspirin or clopidogrel, um, monotherapy is currently the recommendation. When you look at an uh, asymptomatic patients, antiplatelet is a 2A recommendation, and then 2B recommendations are dual antiplatelet therapy for a prolonged time, and then um, Voropax are mainly because of the risk of bleeding, okay? Two exciting things that I think will be coming up uh, in the near future, especially COMPASS at the end of this month, will be presented at the European Society of uh, Cardiology, over 27,000 patients, again, a combined uh, CAD population, but a large group of PAD patients. This uh, is a three-arm study uh, really looking at uh, aspirin, Rivaroxaban 5 milligrams twice daily, and then aspirin, Rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams. And so that large outcome study was stopped early. Um, we're really excited. I don't know the results. Uh, I, would, I can't wait to, to see them in, in Barcelona. And then Voyager PAD, which is a post-vascular intervention study of Rivaroxaban versus placebo. All right. So I'll conclude here because I'm over my time, but um, I'll say that an antiplatelet agent right now um, aspirin or clopidogrel is still recommended. 1996, if the guidelines were in place, they would have said the same thing. Um, and we need more evidence because little exists, uh, especially for uh, post-PVI care. Um, and then we really need more studies and FAST. Thank you very much. We'll wait for questions, and then I'll introduce our next speaker here.